Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this Catholic Truth Podcast, where we bring you the truth of Jesus Christ and the apostles that has come down to us over 2,000 years. And sometimes on our show, we have special guests who have great stories or who have written books or who have converted to the Catholic Church. And we are glad to have Tom Cabine back. In fact, it's Deacon Tom Cabine, and he was with us previously on another episode, which we will link below in the show description notes. And he shared his testimony of being being a former witness of working in the Watchtower, the world headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses for 12 years. And he shared his story of how he went from there to becoming a Baptist and eventually discovered the early church fathers. And he read the writings of the earliest Christians. And he was blown away at how closely the Catholic church resembled the earliest Christians. And that is what got him to start studying the early church and studying the Catholic church. And he eventually made his way to Catholicism with his entire family. And now he is a deacon in the Catholic Church. He serves in St. Francis Xavier Church in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and he helps hundreds and hundreds of witnesses to uh, with questions that they have. Many have doubts, but aren't allowed to question, you know, so they have to do it so-called secretly. And many, many reach out to him. And he has even had Many uh, Jehovah's Witnesses reach out to him since our last show, and he's just helped so many people. He's so knowledgeable. He understands both faiths so well. And so I would l- really like to welcome back to the show you, Tom Cabine. Thank you for coming back. It's such a joy to have you back on our program with us. Thank you so much, Brian, for the uh, for the introduction. I don't know whether I can live up to that or not, uh, but uh, <laughs> I do appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, uh, it has been... Uh, I think the thing that I really appreciate more is that when I was helping people out of the witnesses uh, before I was Catholic, and I did help many hundreds of them in that way, but since I've become a Catholic, I can now answer the question that almost all of them ask when, when they leave the watchtower, and that is, where do I go from here? And now I can say with confidence, the Catholic Church is the place to go, and here's why. And that must have been a very difficult question for you to answer after for a while, because you probably had to unprogram and undo a lot of the uh, misconceptions that you learned about the Catholic faith and just about Catholicism in general, I would say, right? That is right. Uh, the, the, The Catholic Church, because it is the most prominent member of this great uh, group that they call Christendom, uh, we don't use that word much anymore, but uh, they, because the Catholic Church is is so prominent, it's a prime target for witness uh, vilification. And so... Yeah, and I remember another prominent witness uh, family that uh, came into the Catholic Church that are friends of yours. And I remember they said they had a lot of problems with the Catholic Church, but then when they studied it for themselves, they learned that it's nothing about what the witnesses had said it was. And in fact, when they became Catholic, he, I remember that the gentleman told me, he's like, please tell all the witnesses. He's like, I have never been happier. He's like, I've never found more peace anywhere than in the Catholic Church. And I never would have thought it. <laughs> That's exactly true of, of our family as well. We're we're extremely happy here. Uh, the Catholic Church is vilified not only by witnesses, but mit, most other uh, sects of Christendom. Uh, they they also many evangelical Protestants. They have negative things to say about about the Catholic Church. So so anyway, but I think we're going to talk about some other things. Uh, exactly. Um, so last time you shared your testimony with us of how you became, you know, Catholic and found your way to Catholicism. And um, we had talked last time about wanting to go deeper into some of the problems. You're only, you know, able to go surface uh, value into some of them. But this time I'd like to talk a little bit about the history and about some of the doctrinal problems with the Jehovah's Witnesses and with the Watchtower. So um, maybe before we discuss those in depth, maybe you can just begin by talking about some of the problems that you began to see uh, while you were a witness, some of the things that you began to have doubts about, and some of the things that may have left, maybe had led you out of the witnesses in the first place. Well, uh, the witnesses are, they have a number of uh, erroneous doctrines. And those erroneous doctrines, maybe I'll, I'll kind of start with that. And uh, these are not things that I saw immediately, but be- I begin to have some questions. My my first 
real problem with the witnesses, I think uh, the, the, the most serious problem had to do with their claim that uh, they, in 1914, began a special period, a special period of time in which God was going to deal only with Jehovah's Witnesses, and they would be the only ones that would have his message to give to mankind. But the reason why they believe that <clears throat> is, uh, and I'm going to give you a little list here of beliefs and doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses that are problematic. And the first is Adventism. They, they grew out of the second Adventist movement of the 19th, uh, 19th century, the 1800s. <clears throat> and the Adventist movement is marked by, it was just a movement, it was not a separate religion, but Adventists believe that it is possible through calculations and interpretation of prophecy to calculate or to figure out when Christ is going to return. This is something that Jesus explicitly said, you will not be able to figure out when I'm going to return. And that's why we have to stay alert. So it's founded on a faulty foundation. It, it founded on the idea that you can figure it out. And, and so almost everything in the witness teachings has to do in one way or the other with the nearness of the end, how close it is because We've got that some kind of inside track that we can calculate when it is. So uh, that's sort of foundational. They misunderstand who God is. Their concept of God and what monotheism means is much more along the lines of what Muslims believe than it is what traditional Christians believe. Uh, they do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They, they completely un misunderstand. Not, it isn't even that they misunderstand it. They don't even continue or go into the discussion of the difference between person and nature. Uh, so they also misunderstand who Jesus is. They believe that Jesus is actually another name for the archangel Michael. They do not know who the Holy Spirit is. They don't see it Holy Spirit as having personality, but rather it is an active force, they call it. Uh, <clears throat> they do not understand the nature of man, whether that, that we are made of a physical body and a spirit soul. They teach that your soul is you, that soul is just another name for a man. They do not understand how salvation works. They believe that it's not going to be happening in this life, but in the coming millennium. They don't understand the, the hope of Christians, whether that they believe that Christians are divided into two groups, a group that's going to live in heaven, very, very small, comparatively speaking, and, and the rest of them, they're going to live on earth. They understand, misunderstand God's purpose. They think that God's original purpose was to have everyone live on earth, but they don't explain how it is that thanks to the devil, and his misleading of mankind that now 144,000 people are going to go to heaven. So now that, that, that puts God in a reactionary role against the devil, uh, the, reacting to what, what uh, one of his creatures does. <clears throat> they don't under, they, so the, the whole thing has, or they misunderstand the church. They think of the church in terms of an organization, and that is a, a way to to marshal resources to do something, which is to, to preach this good news. That is the good news that the end is almost here. So they completely misunderstand the gospel, the, the, the good news. They misunderstand the need of a hierarchy. Their hierarchy, they, they believe that they have none, but their hierarchy is more complex than that of the Catholic Church. Um, and then where that has led them is, is in order to separate from other uh, sects of Christendom, they uh, reject. So their, their primary approach to understanding Christianity is negative rather than positive. They're much more defined by what they don't believe, what they reject, than by what they do believe. 
they've rejected the cross. They reject the Trinity, of course, the doctrine of the soul and the doctrine of hellfire. They they have no concept whatsoever of sacraments. Uh, they do baptize, but they don't call baptism a sacrament, and they and they misunderstand what baptism is all about. And then they have these other little crazy things like uh, they don't accept blood transfusions. They don't allow people to serve in the military. They don't uh, allow you to vote, have anything to do with politics in any way. So it, it's really uh, – it started out as a movement, and we'll talk a little bit later about how this happened. Um, and I read that you don't even have Mother's Day or Father's Day or, you know, Valentine's Day. And basically any kind of day that anyone likes is pagan. <laughs> and they try to find some way to make it pagan. Oddly enough, they, they, they still celebrate wedding anniversaries, but no birthdays. And, and it seems that, that primarily their approach to this is driven by a desire to be different from other religions. Uh, it's, this is not as big a deal these days as it was when I was in school, but when I was, Jehovah's Witnesses do not salute the flag of any nation. And so when I was uh, in elementary school in the 1950s, this was a big deal. Me not standing up and, and saluting the flag uh, only not even 10 years after World War II had ended Many, many uh, families that had kids in school with, with me had lost somebody or, or had someone injured in, in the war. And that and patriotism was running high. Patriotism is not as high these days, but that was a big, a big problem. But there's all of these things that they've set up as just a way to separate themselves from other religions. And I'll that makes sense to me. Why that is. Um, and I'll let you continue on any one of those in deeper length, but, um, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me that they, it's more of a separation. It's just because, you know, it shows that we're true and everyone else is not, I guess that's kind of what cults do, but, um, <clears throat> cause a lot of their doctrines that they have and a lot of their teachings that they have really don't make a lot of sense, except that they're different than everyone else's. Like, when I challenge them on, you know, Jesus is Michael the Archangel, they're emphatic that the Catholic Church must show everything from the Bible. And so I asked them where to find that in the Bible and say, well, you know, his voice is like an archangel. I said, yeah, but he also has eyes of fire and white woolly hair. There's a lot of descriptive qualities about Christ in there. But how do you equate that with Michael the Archangel? Where does it say that? And they had no answer for that. And then on other ones, you know, they used to tell me that when I used to talk to them, they said, you know, blood transfusions is like drinking blood and drinking blood is uh, against God and against the Bible. I said, how is that? I, I couldn't make the connections of how their, their doctrines, how they made the connections on all of these things. They didn't make a lot of sense. They said that uh, saluting a flag was considered false worship. You're worshiping something other than God. And I'm like, that, that to me, that didn't, from the outside looking in, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. Cause we know we're not worshiping a flag, you know? And, and the odd, the odd thing about it, and this, this is something that I didn't realize until until long after I left the witnesses, is that their meetings, which are patterned much more around sales meetings than they are any kind of actual worship, I came to the conclusion that witnesses don't actually worship. They do not do any of the things adoration or they don't kneel they their prayers are are quite mechanical they they simply don't do the things they come into a, to a meeting and they begin it with a prayer but the prayer is a is a kind of a uh, almost a secular prayer they they have a, certain things that they say and then and then the meeting is uh either how to present the witness message to people from in door to door or a review over and over and over again of the, of the little distinctive things about Jehovah's witness doctrine, they would never have a, a public lecture about God and the Trinity or, or the nature of God or the nature of man or any of those things. It's all about the end is near, the end is near. So I came to the conclusion that they don't worship at all. And yet they don't want to salute a flag because they think that is worship, but they don't even do worship when they're in <laughs> church or what they call the kingdom hall. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
I just had a, a lot of trouble with those doctrines. And even like the uh, you had mentioned the Holy Spirit, they say he's God's impersonal active force. And I said, yes, but <clears throat> the Bible, you know, calls him he and him and says that the Holy Spirit speaks. And this is what the Holy Spirit has to say. I was like, those are, he, they're using personal pronouns and saying that the Holy Spirit can communicate with us. And so, again, to me, they never gave very satisfying answers. Even when the Jehovah's Witnesses most recently came to my door, you know, I said, you know, what miracles happen in the Watchtower or in the Jehovah's Witness religion? And they say, oh, miracles don't happen because they happen at the end of time. You know, that they'll happen, you know, later. And I say, well, they happen in the Catholic Church all the time. <laughs> you know, I was like, we have priests that can heal people from blindness. We have pre people who have been raised from the dead, you know, really significant miracles that are vi verifiable, scientifically demonstrated, that sort of thing. And they said, they thought about it for about 0.5 seconds, they said, no, miracles only happen at the end of time. And no matter how much I said it, they just repeated the talking points. And I feel like when it comes down to the doctrines that don't make sense, they just repeat the doc, the talking points rather than, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but rather than grappling with it intellectually in an intellectually honest way. Does that you can't sense? grapple with it. You can't grapple with it in an intellectually honest way, because in this, uh, environment the way they they do this the open discussion about things is simply not encouraged and surprisingly they many many witnesses have a tremendous problem with dogma anything stated dogmatically once they leave because almost everything that the witnesses say in their publications is dogmatic they say it in an event when we when i say that it's something proposed by a religious group for our belief, and it's stated authorita authoritatively to be true. Now, the church has dogmas, and dogma is absolutely necessary if you're going to have any uh, kind of, of uh, in-depth study of any uh, subject. I mean, in science, if you were going to study physics or something, you must have certain things that we state dogmatically. For example, that all matter is made up of atoms uh, or, or you know, in medicine, we, there are certain things that we know about the human body that we state dogmatically. You know, blood circulates through the, the heart and the lungs. These are things that we state authoritatively because you can't progress unless you have certain things that you can count on to be true. The world is round. Uh, but uh, the witnesses state so many things dogmatically, and then they change those things. And so when people leave the witnesses, they, they often have a very hard time with dogma in any context. So now when we look at the, at the, at the witnesses, you had asked me this question that, that the witnesses have reversed several beliefs. They used to believe in Christmas, that Jesus was crucified on a cross and it's not a stake. And you ask about where did these changes come about? And they came about, I'm virtually certain, um, at the time of Rutherford. So the witnesses were begun in 1879. They began with, with Charles Russell. And they began as a, as a home Bible study sort of movement. As time went on, Ruther, uh, Russell began to publish his little sermons and things like that. But there was not any really organized uh, group of, of uh, people that were under a, a central sort of headquarters until Rutherford came along. Now, when, when Russell had made all of these predictions and he got more and more dogmatic as time went on, and he had predicted that the world was definitely going to end in 1914. And he had this very extensive series of, of um, calculations, uh, chronological ca calculations and interpretations of the meaning of prophecies that were that led him to the conclusion and all those that followed him that the world absolutely was going to end in 1914 when it didn't end in 1914, this was a problem, but then three years later, Russell died. Now enter Rutherford, uh, 
Rutherford had no kind of religious training at all. He was a lawyer and he didn't believe much in religion, but he liked Russell's books and he wrote, read them sometime in the late 1800s or read some of his books and, and uh, wrote, wrote them a letter and it resulted in him becoming legal counsel for the, for the organization or the, the, international Bible students. And then um, when Russell died, Rutherford seized power. Russell had wanted uh, his, the, the, uh, uh, an editorial committee to be formed to produce literature. He got rid of those, all of those guys, and he took control of that organization. It was a, a fairly major schism. <clears throat> and, uh, he, from then on, began to shape JW doctrine, uh, or actually the, the, the doctrine and, and practice of the people that would become Jehovah's Witnesses. He was the one that changed their name. Uh, he published a book, the seventh book in the series of books that uh, studies in the scriptures that Russell had started. And his that book called The Finished Mystery was a big attack against all political and religious systems. And it, it ended up for him going to prison because of sedition and <clears throat> that little stint in prison, he didn't stay there very long, but this completely shaped his confrontational approach to government and church. He attacked churches. He attacked anything that had to do with government. And I think that was the, this is just my opinion here that that whole approach that he took and again, he was not molded by a, a, a study, a seminary study of Jesus' life or desire to under, really know the scriptures. He was figuring it out for himself. And, and that all created this transformation of, the, of the, the Bible students into Jehovah's Witnesses and a much more cult-like mentality, us versus them. And because of that, um, Witnesses are not encouraged to know their own history. And they also have this environment. Now, I don't know. It's, I've been out of the witnesses now for 40 years. But when I was uh, there, one of the big, big features of, of their, their approach to, to publications was new light. We've got new understandings of things. And whenever the circuit overseer, the traveling representative of the society would come around quite a couple times a year, one of the features of, you know, the Saturday night program was new light. What have we learned in the last six months? And that approach involves kind of mentality of rejecting anything that came before and just accepting what's new. Uh, we, that idea that, Last week's news, that's old news. You know, that's, uh, we're not going to pay any attention to that. And that's why when you try to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses and you show them something that happened in a watchtower 20 years ago or 40 years ago, oh, that's old. We've, that's been replaced by new light. Since that actually then. sounds exactly like the Mormons. They've said the same thing. That, oh, well, you know, they used to teach that, but then we had a new revelation. They call it new revelation rather than new light. But it's, it's the same thing. You know, they say God has shined light on us. And the problem with that is it, contradicts a lot of the older things that have passed before them. And it seems to me that God contradicts. Now, in Christianity, we have an evolution of doctrine. We have an understanding of new light, but it it never contradicts what came before. It only helps us to understand it in a deeper light. Whereas I feel like in the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and certain other religions, it's God taught one thing and then nope, he teaches something completely different now. At least in Mormons, I can't speak for Jehovah's Witness. It almost sounds like he changes his mind quite often. Well, uh, in the Catholic Church, you know what things are dogmatically stated. So we we have in the Catholic faith the Apostles' Creed. The creeds, which are often attacked by some church, the idea of a creed, but creed simply means this is what I believe, credo, uh, Latin, the, the statements in the Apostles' Creed, which I think the earliest written uh, 
version of the Apostles' Creed dates from from early in the second century. So, but those teachings we use still today when we baptize people, we ask exactly those same questions because those beliefs haven't changed a bit. Exactly. When it became time to clarify something with regard to the, the nature of Jesus uh, as a result of Arianism in, in, in the Council of Nicaea in 325, we created a creed. It was slightly changed in, uh, in Constantinople in, uh, what was it, was it 341? Um, but we use that creed every Sunday. It hasn't changed in a, a bit. Um, so the and I might add that the creed didn't contradict anything that Christians believed before exactly. that. It just explained it in a deeper way. Some yes, we added that in, people were having. Exactly. We added the mm -hmm. words God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. These are the qualifiers that we put for Jesus because someone had come up, Arius had come up and said, no, Jesus was not truly divine. He was everything but divine, but he wasn't divine. He wasn't of the same nature as the father. And the church came back and said, yes, he was He's of the same nature, consubstantial with the father. But see, the witnesses don't have any kind of a concept of things like that because almost nothing that Russell taught is still taught by Jehovah's Witnesses. Even his his big deal about the date, 1914, they still have that date, and that's a and it's a still a <laughs> kind of a big deal. But 1914, which was one time the end of the, you know the end has to come by 1914. Now it became then it became the beginning, and th then the end is going to come sometime after it. They're they're running into some real problems now uh, because you know 1914 is over a hundred years back and so they can't they once taught that there was a generation from the that would see 1914 and would see the end but now anybody that was old enough to understand anything about what was going on in the world in 1914 is dead or dying they're not they're they're well over a hundred years old uh this is you know this is 2022 we've got uh, we're coming up on almost 110 years since then so the whole idea of the witnesses uh, teaching things that are changeable, but teaching them dogmatically has a tendency to destroy in their adherence faith in anything that's been stated dogmatically and, and faith ultimately in truth itself. Truth being that my idea of reality conforms with the actual state of affairs, what actually is exists out there. So Which is sad because Jesus is truth that he stated things dogmatically, of course, because he's God, he's the you know divine son of God. But what he said was perfectly true. And we believe that he handed those truths on to the church who passed those on to future generations of the church. So of course, we're going to believe truths because they came from Christ. Of course. Now you ask me, uh, you'd read a, a, a sort of yeah, famous I have it here. magazine. Um, <laughs> yeah, should you believe in the Trinity? And um, it's, I mean, <clears throat> it's riddled with many <clears throat> historical errors and things. But what really struck me is they tried to uh, use the early church fathers to show that the earliest Christians in the first 300 years of the church did not accept the Trinity and they did not accept the divinity of Christ. And so when I went through this, you, I don't know if anyone out there could see it, but I underlined extensively, wrote in the margins, because I have the actual writings of the earliest Christians here. And when I measured up uh, what they said the earliest Christians claimed, and then what they actually claimed were very much different. I mean, they use a lot of ellipses that three periods. They actually change things. I think they summarize what they think the early father said, but none of these quotes are actually what any of the fathers said. So it flabbergasted me how they could be so far off. And if they're that far off with that, what else are they far off on? Just about everything, Brian. Uh, 
So the Watchtower writing policies, and I, I, I worked with the writing department very regularly when I was there because as the uh, supervisor of all the printing operations, I, I had to uh, talk to them about artwork and other kinds of things like that. Um, the, the Watchtower writing policies don't really encourage objective research. They very often start with a conclusion and then set out to prove it by any means possible. They often misquote sources. This is, this is not really honest. They oftentimes quote a scholar, take something out of context, to, as you just pointed out, to try to make them say something that they didn't really say. Uh, or they'll take something about a discussion about one thing and apply it to something else. They, they plagiarize very often without credit. <laughs> uh, just whatever it takes to, to make it appear correct, they do that. And they, and they, and they also do not encourage rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses to check Watchtower claims against secular sources. They're taught to trust the society completely. And, and so because of the fact that there's this regular uh, stream of materials that are coming out of the Watchtower publication printing plants, I don't know if they print the, the Watchtower and Awake magazine anymore, or they just produce it mostly in PDF format, but there's constant written materials that come out and, and you're encouraged to read them. There are two watchtowers each month and two awakes each month, or at least there were when I was there. That means you've got basically a magazine per week that you have to read. They're not big magazines. They're 32 pages long, but, <clears throat> but they, they don't encourage you to check that out against some other sources. So this creates a situation where uh, people begin accepting things without really having the opportunity to check them out. Uh, another thing that they do that, that plays right into this same idea is they publish their articles and books anonymously ever since Rutherford. Now Rutherford took credit for all of the books and he wrote a lot of books and a lot of other articles and things. But after Rutherford, died and nor took over everything that was published by the watchstar society was published anonymously now they claim that that's, this is a mark of humility of the authors they don't want to take personal credit for all of this what it's actually doing is deflecting accountability from individuals to the society so if some individual comes up with a crazy idea, like you shouldn't have a blood transfusion, well, you can't go to that guy and say, hey, I want to know where you got this idea. No, this is the society that's saying this. This is basically God working through his people. So if you question the conclusion, you're really questioning God. Now, that may sound crazy to you. To witnesses, it doesn't sound crazy. They they accept that very very much. So when we left the, the witnesses, I remember having, remember having a conversation with uh, somebody who who when he he left, he said, I, "You know, I was curious how Jews understand the prohibition in the Old Testament against eating blood. Uh, why don't they, you know?" take blood transfusions? Why don't they interpret it like the witnesses do? And, and this rabbi uh, kind of laughed and he told this guy, well, the law, it had always been an understanding that the law was never, never superseded taking a person's life. So in other words, if it came down to obeying the law, or preserving someone's life, life always trumped the law. So during the Middle Ages, when there was famine, widespread famine, that all of the, the rabbis, they told the people, 
even to eat on days that were supposed to be fasting days because people could very easily die from not eating on a fasting day because they were so malnourished. Uh, even in Jesus' day, Jesus said, you guys will break, the, will break the law to pull your, your donkey out of a, a ditch. The life of a donkey was more important than, than the law. And, and that, and that was in, you know, part of, of the, the, uh, understanding of, of, of Jewish teaching was that human life always trumped the law. So I guess nobody ever thought of that with the witnesses. They never thought of checking with what the Jews thought because they don't want outside thinking on things like that. And yet how many witnesses, I mean, I've personally known uh, at least a handful who've lost family members because they would not take a blood transfusion when there was a, a serious illness, um, hemophilia, a uh, car accident, uh, and yet they feel no responsibility for it because they can blame it on the society. And that's really sad, especially since it came from people who weren't theologically trained, like Ruth the Third, who didn't know Jesus, didn't know the Bible, didn't really know anything about religion, but seemed to want power. And, you know, that actually struck me, too, when I was reading an article about people who were complaining against the Watchtower Society because they had produced their own Bible called the New World Translation. And they wanted to know, well, who printed it? Who are the, you know, the translators behind this? And they refused to give up the names. Eventually, people found out and it was almost something of a scandal because they didn't nobody of the four translators had any Hebrew knowledge of the scriptures and none had. Well, one of the four had studied Greek, but it wasn't even Koine Greek, which is the language of the Bible. So none of them had any um, scholarly or educational studies in biblical languages. And yet they were the ones who translated the Watchtower Bible. Yeah. And I've got some, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, a personal opinion here. <laughs> uh, I I knew all of the people that were on that, that, uh, Biblical Translation Committee. Uh, Fred Franz had had studied some Greek in school. Uh, George Gangus was Greek by nationality, but the guy wasn't a scholar. He was a nice guy. I liked him. He was lived right across the hall from me. But so I have a theory which I'm going to expound here a little bit. In 1970, in the late 1970s, at some point, maybe 78. The Watchtower Society published an, an interesting Bible. It was called the Bible in Living English. It was written by a uh, translated by a guy named Stephen Byington. And Stephen Byington was a true scholar. The guy was a master of at least, I don't know, a half a dozen languages. I wondered why it was that the Watchtower Society would publish an kind of an odd version and it published one one printing of it we printed it one time and never reprinted it <laughs> because and, and we never pushed it we never tried to get people to buy it like we did everything else <laughs> i actually personally believe that byington did almost all of the translation of that bible according to the, to their wishes and that he did that as a quid pro quo for ha having his kind of odd Bible in living English published. I think that he would, he did all the heavy lifting. They approved it. Um, they meaning mostly probably Fred Franz and, and nor approved it. And then they, and they had it printed. This is just a theory that I have, but one time I spoke to a member of the governing body about that. And he, and he said, well, when I found out what had happened, he says, I was so angry. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't talk about it. So he didn't tell me this. I'm not going to quote him on this, but he definitely gave me the idea that there was something funky going on with, uh, with Stephen Byington and the, and the new world translation. So that's, that's my theory on this because there absolutely was not any scholarship there. And, and there weren't any witness scholars around who were willing to do that. So I think the only scholar i can trace even closely to to that is byington he was not a really 
deeply religious man. He was an anarchist, <laughs> but, mm. but what an odd thing, isn't it? That they would, that they would publish someone's Bible uh, and, and never use it in their, in their very, very rarely quoted in their publications, do one printing of it. And that was it. And then remake it with people who have no idea of the biblical languages. It's, it just goes back to what you were saying, the, <laughs> the anonymous uh, nature that they have of printing stuff that you don't know what they're saying or printing. And what really frustrates me and is I have a large collection, <clears throat> you know, of Watchtower magazines and such, but what, I, what struck me when I read these is they always, and they're the only ones I know who do this, but they'll say like, <clears throat> One scholar in England said this. A scholar in Australia said this. One person in Siberia said this. And, and I'm making this up off the top of my head, but they just say, we don't know if they're scholars. We don't know who they are. We don't know if the quotes are accurate. There's no way to source them. There's no way to trace them, cite them. And if they're really worried, <clears throat> or I should say, if they're really confident that they have the truth, then why not just cite the sources? Why not just put them out there for all to see? Anytime that people don't want to discuss something and, and, and let you ask whatever questions you have about it, if they're unwilling to do that, a red flag should go up because they're not confident of, of what they believe, that, that, that what they believe or what they are st saying is true. And that's in every context. It's true politically. It's true scientifically. It's true in religion. Anytime somebody doesn't want to talk about the truth, uh, or openly ask questions, there's a possibility that they're hiding something. Yeah. And I went to a meeting once going back to what you were saying about <clears throat> how they just want people to accept what they say authoritatively, but they don't allow people to question, which is why people have to reach out to you secretly when they have doubts, because if you have doubts, you can be disfellowshipped and that sort of thing. That's right. And uh, right. <clears throat> I remember I went to some meetings to, over the watchtower just to see what they were like. And it's probably not like this everywhere. I'm, I don't know because I haven't gone everywhere. But the ones I did go to, we would read a Watchtower magazine and they would have a set of questions at the end, and which you're supposed to answer. And then they went around the circle answering the questions of which, you know, I just listened. But anytime someone gave in a thought or an idea of their own the the leader would immediately step on that like, you know brother so and so that is not what the watchtower said what, what what did the watchtower say and they would almost have to say it word for word in order for it to be correct and some of these people had really well thought out uh deeply spiritual thoughts on the matter but they weren't allowed to express them and i found that very bizarre yeah no but because it it's really not a discussion and when they come to your door and say i'd like to have a bible discussion with you what it really is, is an indoctrination session. That's exactly what they're doing. Uh, they, they, th that format where you have a paragraph, they, they, they ask a question about the paragraph. The answer that they're looking for must be taken directly from word for word right out of the paragraph. And then they read the paragraph to sum it up. That, that is just indoctrination. That's all it is. It is not a discussion. Yeah. It is not a search for truth. And, and so that's, that's just the nature of the beast. That's, that's what it is. Did um, you have any last, can, I can, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I can multiply examples of this, but the fact is people, anyone can find truth. God wants you to know what is true. God embodies truth everything that exists it came out of his mind and he wants you to know what's in his mind so he made you in a way that you can understand the world around you the world is comprehensible and and we can find what is true sometimes it's difficult you have to be a detective almost to find out what's what's true but you can find it because god will help you to do it those who seek will find. So that would that's that's kind of my closing thought for anyone who might be a Jehovah's Witness or know someone who's one of Jehovah's Witnesses is to encourage them. And to, don't be afraid to go where the truth leads. Exactly. 
even if it leads you right to the Catholic Church, which it will. <laughs> or even if it doesn't right away, you know, if you think it's leading you to Episcopalian or Orthodox, you have to go where you think the truth is leading, but don't close your heart off to that. You know, and I think, as you said, eventually, if we believe that it will lead you fully to the Catholic Church, I mean, you went to Baptist and Episcopalian, eventually made your way, you know, to the fullness of the faith, because people will say, well, the Catholic Church teaches things dogmatically, and they think they, you know, are we get accused of thinking that we're God's spokesman. And, you know, there may be some truth to that, but, and they say, well, Jehovah's Witnesses, the church of God, Mormons, they all think the same thing. I say, I, I agree. But the difference between them, the big difference is that we believe Jesus started the Catholic church. And there's a lot of biblical and historical evidence to, uh, to, to substantiate that. And if you read the writings of the earliest Christians, they teach what we teach today. Whereas the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of God, Christian scientists, and all of these modern churches who claim to be restorative Christianity, claim to be the true church, were all started in the 17 and 1800s by different men at different times with different messages. And they don't go back to Christ. And there's no, there's no there's no way you can verify or trace that back. And if you read the writings of the earliest Christians, their, their, their religions do not match up to what the earliest Christians taught. As far as I know, nobody taught the 144,000 doctrine that the Jehovah's Witnesses taught. There's only one person in the early church I know who taught that Jesus wasn't God, and that was Arius, and that's what led to the whole problem in the first place. And the whole church jumped on him because it was different than what regular Christianity already taught. And so I think it's very easy and verifiable to find truth if you're open to look for it. Yes, and there's no, there's nothing to fear from asking questions about things. Uh, the 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 truth can stand up to scrutiny. So uh, well, it, it, I, go ahead. I might add to that there is something to fear in the sense that, and this is not what you're talking about, but I know a lot of witnesses and Protestants are coming to us here at Catholic Truth saying we want to become Catholic, but we're afraid because our families, you know, they, well, if we care what they think of us, or we care about being disfellowshipped, or we care about this. That's a, you know, that's a legitimate fear. I, I don't think that's what you're discussing, but I think the trip can be a little difficult, but we have to remember that Jesus tells us to pick up our cross and follow him. And I think that's a big reminder. I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, of course, uh, anything that you, anytime that you follow truth, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. And he said that families would be divided one against the other. But, but this is true in every context. How many families uh, do you maybe know? I mean, e even now, maybe you've got parents that are Republicans and children that are Democrats that are fighting with one another, and they cannot have a, a civil discussion about things. Uh, when you take a stand for believing anything, somebody's going to disagree with you and not like that. But that's the nature of truth, that that some people aren't going to like it. Now, I don't know where we are time-wise, uh, but I was going to tell you very briefly, when, I, when the, the, the one thing that really uh, moved me to to seriously question was this, uh, the, the doctrine that they have of, of calculating the time of the end. And, um, and that's, it was wrestling with that issue and trying to correlate their, I, I first started out by a, a, a very thorough understanding of their teaching. What are you teaching here? And what does it mean? How important is it? It became, you know, it was a foundational teaching for their claims to be God's representative. And their doctrine basically claims that, that the, the, um, that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BC and, and until 1914 uh, AD, there was 2,520 years that, bought, that, that passed during that period of time during which God's kingdom was not active. <clears throat> and that explains why Jesus would come somewhere in the middle of that. And then the church that he founded would just fall apart, which is what they teach. When I, when I learned not due to my own efforts, but another uh, witness who, who did this and sent a letter into the Watchtower Society, which I providentially got to read, that convinced me that you could actually take secular sources and validate or invalidate the claims that the witnesses made. 
that, so that was where my my beginning of the end started with with Jehovah's Witnesses. And it didn't just <clears throat> convince you either. It was kind of like a bombshell in the Watchtower itself, wasn't it? It it was yes. <laughs> I was sort of writing on the on the atomic bomb there. I didn't realize uh, how 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 seriously they would take it, but uh, but they did. But a uh, lot of a serious, a lot of high up members began to doubt the organization and really ended up leaving the absolutely. organization in the end too. But when when people who are writing the the, the literature don't believe. In what they're writing, th- this is terrible. This is really a, a, a tremendous form of of uh, deception. Because if I'm claiming to, to speak for God, but I don't really believe what I'm teaching, that's a, that's a real lie, and it's a bad lie. Because <clears throat> your other people are going to make life decisions based on what you're telling them. And if those if those life decisions are based on on just something that you know is wrong, boy, that's a that's a heavy responsibility to carry. Yeah. And uh, for anyone out there, if you're a witness yourself, if you're questioning, struggling, looking to leave, just want to know more about these things, Tom is available to talk. He counsels and helps and answers questions of countless countless witnesses from around the Lots world. Of and really high ranking ones too that, you know, of course won't make their names known, but um, if you would like, you know, we're going to put his email down below in the comments and, and description section of this video, and you can reach out to him, you know, anonymously. He's one of the nicest people you'll ever talk to. He's extremely knowledgeable and he's just helped so many people. So if you're someone who's really struggling and you're just tired of struggling, you're tired of doubting and you really want answers, he's there for you. And of course we have several videos on uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and some of the things that Tom talked about. I mean, the false predicting of 1914, but then it became 1918 and then 1925 and then 1975 and, and others in between that. And hundreds of thousands of people, witnesses, left the organization in 1975 after the world didn't end because they claim to speak from God, but God can't seem to get the truth right. And so this has made countless people doubt, and it's okay to doubt. If the witnesses are true, your doubting will lead to seeking and asking questions, and then those questions will be answered in a rational way. But I love what uh, Mr. Kabin here said. He said the more he researched Catholicism, even when he read books that were against Catholicism, the more confident he became about it and the stronger the foundation was. The more he researched uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, he said the more questions he had, the more doubts came up, the more holes were in the, the, the picture, doctrinally, historically, and so on. So if you seek the truth, you don't have to be afraid of it because the truth can stand up for itself. And I just want to challenge you to reach out to Mr. Kabin, Deacon Kabin, if you would like to ask him, just ask him a question or many questions or just share with him your story. He's happy to talk over the phone or by email. So, you know, I just throw that out there to everyone. And uh, I just want to, yeah, you're welcome. And I just want to thank you all for watching our show today and uh, feel free to reach out to us. If you have any questions about anything regarding the Catholic church and uh, please pray for us and please pray for all witnesses who might be struggling. Please pray for, you know, that they may see the, and have the grace of God as well to go where he leads. Thank you all for watching and God bless you.